Hi friends, welcome back. Let's talk about the stock market, electric vehicles, and baseball. So let's just jump right in. Um, we can see what was moving, not moving today. Uh, so Microsoft, Apple, Google, Meta were all down. Nvidia, Amazon, and Tesla was up. Disney was up, probably the biggest today. I can see this here. And then they had some uh, energy stocks moving up as well. Um, if we take a look at the indexes, you guys can check out here. Uh, mid cap was the only one that was in the green, uh, whereas your micro cap, small cap uh, were red, along with your S&P, uh, NASDAQ, and the Dow uh, was the biggest loser of the day. Um, always keep a track of these things to get a general sense of, of where the market is going. And also too, we like to look at sectors as well. So energy was the winner, right? Uh, as long as, along with uh, utilities and basic materials. And then the biggest win, uh, loser today was actually technology. And um, we'll also take a look more at uh, bond yields. Uh, the two year was at uh, 4.63 as of now. We're still inverted. The 10 year is 4.25. Um, the news that really uh, sort of uh, stuck out to me today actually was that uh, gasoline prices are expected to go up uh, $4 a gallon now, guys. And um, you can let me know where it is at your neck of the woods. I mean, obviously it varies. Uh, by region, but I think this is as a whole. And this is according to AAA, uh, the national average is, um, again, uh, gas prices are gonna go up, so you're gonna see $4. Uh, we've been creeping up since January, and uh, I believe this is the highest since, what, 2022. So um, this is a seasonal thing, as you guys know, but uh, for me personally, uh, whenever I see this stuff, I, I just always feel like gasoline prices are a scam. That's just my opinion on this stuff. It's been like that for a long time where I just, I don't like gas, <laughs> that's just me. Uh, moreover, I, I wanna talk about this. Um, this is actually BYD and um, CNBC ran an interesting uh, article about this regarding that uh, many car makers are worried about the, um, one of the BYD's uh, models coming out. I believe it's called the Seagull. And um, the reason I'm putting this together with the uh, gas prices is because, you know, obviously um, if we could find a cheaper way to run your vehicle and get to work, you know, get to where you wanna go, uh, why not do it? And the Seagull's a, a scary to other automakers because it can come in so cheap. So as of now, my understanding of this, according to um, what was reported in CNBC, I guess you can pick these things up for uh, around $10,000, which is very, very cheap for a car. Now, if they do bring this thing, and this is again, BYD, uh, the Chinese made car and um, Warren Buffett was backing it early on. Um, but if they do bring this thing to the USA, uh, they'll probably have to change a few things here and there, and that will certainly up the price. Regulations on building cars in the US uh, is gonna be different than what it is in other countries or in places like China, for example. Um, when I look at this thing though, it reminds me of like, um, if for those of you old enough to remember the uh, Geo Metros, uh, was that Chevy? I can't remember the Geo Metro. You guys can write in the comments. I, I just remember those, those tiny little cars um, that were essentially built for gas mileage, right? That's, that's all it really is. Uh, Cause they don't, they don't go fast. Um, I, I think this thing, it tops out like 85 miles an hour, something like that. Um, you could actually take a look at the interior. Now, one thing I, I think is really positive about this one and something I, I've never really liked about the Teslas, uh, on the BYD, they actually have a, a center, you know, digital screen right there. You guys can see right there. Uh, the Teslas don't have that. The Teslas only have like basically your, you know, tablet on the, on the right. And I always thought that was poor design. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if Tesla's the only car company out there that like does not have this, you know, left, uh, right by the, the steering wheel dashboard. So I just think that's more intuitive. Um, you guys can let me know if there's other vehicles out there that, you know, to say only center council, nothing on the left. But uh, I think this BYD, just in terms of functional design, it's totally fine. Um, you know, I have not driven one of these and I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, testing it. Actually, BYD is trying to come into Korea. Um, as you probably would guess, the Korean manufacturers obviously would not want a, a cheaper electric vehicle to be challenging them because, um, you know, this essentially uh, will be, I, I, my personal opinion, like very popular. Uh, if you can get it this cheap in, in multiple markets. Um, so the downside of a, a, a small little car like this would be the range. So the range isn't so great. Um, it's, I don't think it's meant for road trips. It's just meant for, you know, going to work and back, that kind of thing, grocery store. So they're saying here, um, single charge, 190 miles. I guess theoretically you can get a long range run for 250 miles. Um, and then, uh, yeah, oh, so top speed is 80. So not 85, 80, but I, I knew it wasn't really fast. And, and, and you probably don't want to floor with this kind of car anyway. Uh, so basically, um, if, if you're worried about speeding tickets, uh, and you have a problem with that, this would be the car for you because you're definitely not going to be going to be able to speed. Now, the interesting thing about this um, is I, I think this kind of uh, um, you know vehicle, you're going for to sell as many as possible because uh, I don't think the margins are going to be great. It says here, uh, its initial study of BYD Seagull found uh, it to be efficiently and simplistically designed, engineered, and executed, but with unexpected quality and anticipated uh, reliability. Um, what they did uh, is do done very well. And this again, like it's like there's like an independent firm that 
uh, looked at this thing, but um, I, I will treat this as an advertisement for the company. I, although I do think it's, it's worth looking at because, um, you know, you want to pay attention to what uh, competitors are doing. Uh, sufficiently done, it says here, for the price, it's well equipped. BYD even lowered the starting price of the vehicle by 5% earlier this month and down from uh, roughly 11,000 11, price earlier this year. Uh, it says here, despite the cheap price, the company still uh, makes, quote, some money <laughs> on the Seagull at a minimum breaks even. And um, again, I think this is a really interesting vehicle to track. Um, you know, you probably get it uh, maybe with tax and licensing, stuff like that. Um, if they do keep it in this range, maybe it'll come to the U.S. at 15 grand or something of that nature. We'll, we'll see what it ends up being. Um, and also, too, if it can actually do enter the U.S. market, because I think many manufacturers will want to keep this thing out. Um, now, we're talking about uh, automakers here, because again, um, when I look at gas prices, I think this is more incentive for people to want to get into uh, electric vehicles if you're interested. Um, it is a risky, risky market, though, because companies do fail. Uh, Fisker, I guess they're not going to get a deal. That's what the headlines are. Um, there was rumor that there, some big automaker, maybe like a Nissan, would come in and buy them out. You've been following this. Um, essentially, Henrik Fisker introduced his car. I think it was called the Ocean, I want to say. Uh, it had like solar panels on the roof. It was designed for like a younger audience. They even structured their financing to attract young people. Uh, but now we're like worried about this thing being delisted and basically going bankrupt. Um, I was, you know, been watching this thing just because it's out of curiosity what's going to happen to it. Because actually, because I remember when they introduced it, I actually thought the vehicle was a nice looking car. But Henrik had a had a, like a history of this kind of stuff where, you know, making these promises that they just couldn't quite keep. Uh, the stock then went down. We're like, you know, 98%, basically all your money's gone. It's trading at nine cents a share. So if anyone was in this thing from the very top, um, you can let me know. Um, I, I <laughs> it's not looking good. I'll just say that, I'll just say it's not looking good. A market cap at like 49, $50 million. It seems like someone would just come and just buy this thing up, but maybe the tech is so bad that like nobody wants it. It's kind of crazy. Uh, so unfortunately, if you also too, if you're working at, at Fisker, probably you're gonna be let go would be my, would be my guess. Um, the reason why I bring up the let go stuff is uh, this is kind of an interesting headline I saw today. Uh, employment in 16 U.S. states remains below pre-pandemic levels. Um, take a look at these uh, uh, charts here. So this is the demand, um, which is the black line right here, right? So for uh, how many jobs that, that we you know need, this is the supply. So actually short of workers. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the job market is great for you, meaning that, and I've said this several times on the channel, uh, the jobs that are opening, the jobs that are hiring may not be the one that you necessarily want. Um, as I mentioned before, many tech companies are firing, uh, finance is firing. Um, but the things, the things that seem to be hiring is like your, your retail um, or like your uh, uh, travel related, like your hotel, hospitality. And there's always going to be a job in, in, in Medicare um, or uh, medical services, those kind of things. I always mention that as being a stable uh, job. Now, the other thing that was kind of interesting about this chart, and we're talking about employment here, is um, jobs are moving a bit around uh, the country. Um, so if you take a look at this here, so this is essentially showing you, okay, where has unemployment gone down? Where has unemployment gone up? So unemployment has actually been going up in the uh, the, um, the light blue color here. So this would be like your West Coast. Also Oklahoma and Illinois, which is kind of interesting. So um, I'm not quite sure what's going on in Oklahoma um, to be you know similar to the other states. I do know though that um, the bigger losers in terms of uh, workers have been, it looks like, uh, California, uh, New York, and uh, Maryland have been shedding workers. And I think basically what's going on is you have, you know, one, people going into retirement, and then two, people, you know, with the whole pandemic, and now you can work from home, you're going from more expensive markets to cheaper markets, right? And also, too, you may have people uh, retiring. So you can see here, uh, California down uh, 400,000 workers, New York down 159,000, Maryland down 137,000. And um, it, it's, uh, this is the chart uh, st uh, tracking all that stuff. I was surprised though, actually too, also Hawaii down um, 20,000 workers. But um, this is something that um, I think is important. And, and again, we, we talk about this when you follow the markets is you wanna know what is the consumer doing? Because uh, the US market is largely driven by consumer spending and you need people to have jobs, to have money to buy uh, said products when companies say like Apple say, hey everyone, we got a new Vision Pro. You need people actually to be able to uh, buy said thing. Now, speaking of money, it's actually interesting. Um, Trump actually had, if you remember, been following this whole thing, and he's got a lot of cases against him. He lost the New York one. And at one point, because um, there's interest when he doesn't pay back uh, New York, it was something crazy like $100,000 a day, like, like a crazy amount of interest. But um, he got his uh, fraud case penalty reduced to $175 million. So um, congratulations to uh, Mr. Trump. We'll see if he actually can end up paying it back. He says he's going to pay this one back. 
we'll see. You know, and, and I mean, this is the kind of stuff he track is like, will the money be there? We'll, we'll see. <laughs> um, now, if he, if he sells all of his, uh, I guess, holdings of his um, social media company, this is the true social thing. Um, they're going to start trading. I think it's, is it the NASDAQ they're trading on? Let's see here. It says, I think it's the NASDAQ. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but um, essentially, he had the SPAC. I think it was like last year even or, or, or more. And um, I remember it was a DWAC. I called it DWAC. And it had a really crazy run, kind of like your, you know, hypey crypto kind of stuff. Um, it's completely not trading on fundamentals. So if you're trading a thing, yes, you can make money just trading it. Um, but uh, it is extremely volatile. The last I checked, I just was looking at the share price. I think it was like $50 a share or something like that. And SPACs tend to start at 10, right? So it actually did really quite well for a lot of people. Um, when it goes, it switches its ticker. Get this, it's going to be ticker uh, DJT. Uh, We'll see. I would expect it to decline, but this could be trading like a crypto kind of thing. So I'm just telling you guys, it's not trading on any kind of fundamentals whatsoever. This is a not, not a profitable company. Uh, it is a relatively new company. And if Twitter can't make money being profitable, uh, what makes you think True Social can? But we'll find out. Maybe they figure out a way to pull it out. <laughs> uh, my personal opinion is that Trump needs the money. He'll probably sell all of his holdings as soon as he possibly can and possibly even issue more and delete you, uh, dilute you. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, money changes people. And, and uh, the reason why I mentioned the whole money changes people thing is because there were reports that the partners that uh, Trump got involved with in order to bring this company to, to the public uh, were suing um, Mr. Trump. And so we'll see what happens with that. Um, and uh, the other the issue is too, which I, what I mentioned in the intro about baseball, um, Shohei Watani actually made a statement regarding his interpreter and the gambling situation. So um, again, money changes people, right? And, and you always want to be real cautious on, on who you get involved with. Now, this is a kind of interesting one. So Shohei, and if you haven't followed the story, he plays for the Dodgers now. $700 million contract is like the highest you know, one in baseball. And um, essentially, I, I, what it looked like is that his interpreter was basically gambling a bunch of his money, uh, he being Shohei's away or something of that nature. And then um, uh, Otani's saying, like, I had nothing to do with this stuff. I don't know what that guy's doing with the money. <laughs> I, I, don't know, no, I took no part of this stuff. And I, I, I have no reason to believe... Um, that uh, he, he's uh, you know making stuff up or anything like that, meaning that I I, I don't I don't have any reason to doubt uh, Shohei, but um, you know we'll see what this is kind of things. You, you never know with this stuff. I just I just think in his uh, career and this kind of stuff, there's no reason to be like you know betting and getting involved with any crazy stuff. I just my feeling is probably his interpreters like you know saw dollar signs and just had a, a gambling problem or, or whatever, and um, you know who knows maybe on that. And uh, just to be careful who you do business with, especially too when you. Um, you know, have a lot of money uh, fall into your, your lap and, and you kind of want to set your, how can I say, guidelines early with people that you do business with, right? And this is being an example of that. So anyway, I'd love to hear your uh, thoughts on any one of these stories. Always appreciate your time and uh, I'll catch you in the next video.